Again, this is part eight of a study on the book of Revelation. We have covered a whole lot of material, all in an attempt and an effort to understand this book. Uh, one of the reasons we do that is because there are people who view it allegorically. Everything's a, a symbol. It just symbolizes the triumph of good over evil. You just can't take any of the book of Revelation literally. And there are a whole lot of people who believe that. There's another group of people who says, yes, um, the book of Revelation, however, does not refer to a future time except as it is future in the church age. All of the churches spoken of in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, are characteristics of the, the church age, things that will happen at this time and this time and so forth. Um, there's the Laodicean age, there's the uh, uh, Philadelphia age and the like. Then there are others, the historic stand of the Roman Catholic Church. They are what's called preterists, and that means that they believe that it's all past. It is all coded information for people who lived at that time has no relevance today. Now, of course, two things as a result. One, they are trying to combat the fact that Revelation 17 speaks of the great harlot, of which they are the antitype. It speaks of the, uh, the, uh, the great harlot church, and the Roman Catholic Church is what's being spoken of there, riding on the back of the beast, uh, which, of course, is the ten nations of Western Europe. Uh, with Rome as their capital. It'll be the governing capital. It'll be the religious capital. And then, as a result, they do not believe in the thousand-year reign of Christ. You know, you go to the book of uh, Revelation chapter 20, and it says, and they ruled and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And they do not believe in that. They believe that they are going to sway the world or better the world and bring back the kingdom uh, and uh, that they are part of that, and they are ruling and reigning for Christ right now. That's what the Pope is. What other minister has an ambassador assigned to where he lives? <laughs> what other minister has a, a state officials come to him for advice? We just had read uh, uh, to us that our own president, as a result of the Pope's visiting Cuba, he got, gets down in the plane and uh, right on Cuba, and he kisses uh, the ground. I think he's a little feeble. Now I think they're bringing the ground up to him. I have news for him. Every time I get off a plane, I get off and I kiss the ground. But it's for, <laughs> it's for totally different reasons than that. Anyway, that's the, that's the blessing that, um, that he gave to Cuba. So now, as a result, we're going to lighten up on Cuba. Uh, that's the power and influence of, of this man. But, of course, he's absolutely wrong. I, I've got news for you. Pope John Paul II isn't even a saved man. He's not saved. He's, he's not going to heaven. And unless he believes in Jesus Christ the way we say, the Bible says, he is never going to be there. Despite the fact that he has given his life over to religious ritual and activity and influence and, uh, and the good of the world and the like, he's not going to be there. Because he believes in a works religion to get saved. Now, what is the true um, view of the book of Revelation? It is the futurist view. That is, it is future from where we are. Obviously, it's going to be present someday. It's going to actually transpire someday. But from where we are, we're looking to the future. And uh, some believe, as futurists, that chapters 2 and 3 are still past. We've discussed that with um, the radio uh, Bible class people, the Discovery House and the like. Uh, they are futurists that believe that uh, chapters 1 through 3 are yet past, the rest is yet future. We believe that except for the vision of John on Patmos and the actual writing of the book itself, everything from that point onward is yet future. Now, one of the reasons that we believe that is because of some of the things Christ himself says to these churches. Now, one of the things that he says here in chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 7, to the angel of the church at Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. Now, we have gone through already and spent a, 
basically uh, the greater part of one whole study time to show you what the key of David is. The key of David is the key of the house of David. It's a uh, part of the Davidic covenant where David himself is promised a son who would sit upon his throne forever. Part of the authority of the king of Israel is to accept or reject entrance into the kingdom. Well, what about the keys of the kingdom that were given to Peter? They were given to Peter and uh, uh, the keys plural because the disciples are what we now know as the apostles that Jesus chose. This is excluding Paul. Paul is not one of the twelve. He is not the 13th apostle. The apostle Paul has nothing whatsoever to do with Israel's program, period. He is a Gentile apostle, and the message he preaches is apart from Israel's covenant and program. That's the message we preach today. However, we do study about the keys of the kingdom. Now, it's keys plural because as the holder of the master key of, of the kingdom, Jesus Christ, and we, we mentioned that he went to one of those stores and had some keys made, delegated the authority to his disciples to allow them into the kingdom, men into the kingdom, or to exclude them from uh, the kingdom. So that these, um, the reference to the keys of the kingdom are uh, a reference to the fact that the king, who had the ultimate authority, delegated it to other kings or judges, uh, the, the apostles, and they sit at the gates and allow men in or reject them. And that's why we have, and we'll look at it here in a moment, references to the door of the kingdom, references to the fact that they are delegated authority, and references to the fact that as judges, they could either bind or loose sins. Now let's go back to the book of uh, Matthew. The book of Matthew in chapter 16. And where he says, in verse number 18, he was asking them, who do men say that I am? And they were saying, well, John the Baptist, uh, prophet Elijah, you know, they were tossing things back and forth that people would say about Christ. Then finally he said, but who do you say that I am? Of course, uh, Peter immediately announced, you are the Christ. Now, that is the word for the Messiah, the son of the living God. We profess, we believe with all of our hearts, you are the guy. You're the Messiah. And so Jesus said, based on that profession, of course, you're saved. And upon this rock, the rock of that profession, of the Jews or Gentiles under Israel's program, that Jesus is the Messiah, uh, I'm going to build my church. In other words, that's, that's, that is what was required for church membership. The first thing you have to do to get into the kingdom church is to believe that Jesus Christ is Israel's Messiah. Nothing else will do. If you don't take that first step, you don't get into Israel's kingdom church, of which uh, Jesus Christ was going to go to sit on the right hand of the Father, and now entrance into the kingdom church was transferred to Peter and the other 11. Now it says, verse 19, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you'll bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you'll loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, we'll not go there now, but uh, it's in relationship to a person's sins. Because they will have the gift of discernment, which no one else has today, they will be able to look into a person's heart and detect the reality, the genuineness of what, whether or not they've believed. If they haven't, they're out. Uh, they're rejected. If they have, they're accepted in. Now, uh, uh, let's go from here to the uh, book. Well, we're in Matthew. Let's go to chapter number 25. And 
and we'll start reading with verse number one, and we'll read and make comments as we go. Because he, this particular portion is really misunderstood. Uh, it has to do with entrance into the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, what do we have at the end of the book of Revelation? The marriage supper of the Lamb. We have mentioned there the bride and the bridegroom. And uh, you have to understand uh, Middle East, Eastern customs and the like, going from uh, the one house to the, to the other house. And uh, he picks up the bride along the way and takes her then to his house. And they have, a, they have parties all along. <laughs> uh, the father has a party. She's finally out of the house. And the son has a, uh, has a party because uh, now, she's, uh, now she's here. Five of them were wise, but five of them were foolish. This is typical of the nation of Israel. The five wise virgins are the remnant. Uh, remember the book of Daniel, they that be wise shall understand. They that be wise shall instruct many as to what to do. But then the wicked are not going to understand. They're not going to be wise. That this is Israel at the end time. People who are alive just prior to the start of the kingdom. They're going through the tribulation period. They that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now, oil, of course, is, is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And remember, Jesus talked about the fact when he goes up that the Spirit of God would be in them and on them. He would be with them to see them through, that that was one of the signs that they were uh, uh, ready for the kingdom if the, the Spirit of God was, uh, was with them. Now, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. This is Israel's program. At midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go ye out to meet him. Time and again, Jesus Christ is teaching throughout this, this whole portion here, from, from chapter 23 onward, that he, he is going to come, and that people need to be ready and watchful for his coming. For example, let's just back up to, to verse number 42 in chapter 24. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. This is the coming after the tribulation, according to uh, chapter 24 of Matthew. Uh, verse number 44, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man uh, comes. And uh, the uh, verse number 48, the evil servant says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. Uh, verse 50, the Lord of that service shall come in a day when he looks not for him in an hour when he is not aware. He, in other words, he's not ready and he shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. So here is the Jew who says Christ is not uh, coming. Uh, in fact, a second Peter, which is part of the testimony of Jesus Christ, said that there would be those in the last days from among the Jews who would say, where's the promise of his coming? Christ isn't going to come. Where is he? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things are the same. Uh, instead of believing in a Christ in the past, we'll just look to the Christ uh, who claims the man who claims to be Christ now, which is Antichrist. And then you go to the book of first John, which says, if anybody says that, that, uh, Christ has not come in the flesh, he is antichrist. If somebody says that, that he's not come, but, but that this guy, uh, you believe now, uh, uh or this guy who has come uh, is Christ, then you then he is the Antichrist. Do not believe him. You've got to be ready and you've got to know you've got to be wise. So, verse 6 of chapter 25. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. The wise answered, Not so, there, lest there not be enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Now, that just simply means, here's a volitional decision. You cannot 
get to heaven, or in this, in this case, you can't get into the kingdom on the shirt tails of another person, on the decision of another person. Those that had the oil were ready for the Lord's return. The others were unprepared, caught off guard, and were not ready, which means that they're going to be late for the party. The only thing is, according to Mideast custom, if you're late for the party, the doors are shut, and guess what? You can't get in. It's like the song uh, when I was growing up. You're on the outside looking in, and that's what they are. Let's read about it. Uh, the wise answered, no, you go to those who sell and get it for yourselves. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Now, what door is he talking about here? It's the door of the kingdom in, in the analogy. Those that were ready when the Lord came and he got the bride and they went in to party, the door was shut behind them. Those that were ready for and expecting him to come at any time. They prepared themselves, went into the kingdom with him. The others were shut out. Afterwards came also the other virgins saying to us, Lord, open to us. He said, Verily I say to you, I know you not. Watch therefore, said Jesus, because that is the analogy. For you know not the day or the hour when the Son of Man comes. And this per pertains to the end of the tribulation and even past to those 75 extra days we've studied about in Daniel. You've got to be ready. Okay, let's go from here to Luke 13. Luke 13. And we'll start with verse number 23. Now, remember what we're doing. We are providing background information on, a on, on the book of Revelation. A statement Jesus makes, I hold the key of David. I can open and no man shuts. I can shut and no man can open. Well, does that make sense? If we read that just there and don't go comparing Scripture with Scripture, does that, does that make sense? Uh, if we read that as most read it today and apply it to ourselves, we say, who's got the key? You know, how, what, what is he talking about? What door is it? What's well, obvious what door he's talking about if you know the Davidic covenant, if you know who has the master key and then the delegated keys, uh, if you know what door it is to the kingdom, what time it is, the end of the tribulation period, you can understand now as you read uh, these this letter to the uh, uh, church of Philadelphia. It's a group of people that will exist at that time uh, to whom Jesus Christ will address these things. The kingdom is coming. I've got the key. You better get in line with the kingdom program. Okay, verse 23, Luke 13. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? He said to them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter in, but shall not be able. All right. Enter into what? Kingdom. That's what he's talking about. Uh, here is the king coming to Israel and saying, okay, now look, uh, the kingdom is at hand. John the Baptist started it. John the Baptist was in prison. Guess the first thing out of Jesus' mouth publicly. Repent for the kingdom is at hand. Now, please keep this in mind because we're going to go from here to the mandatory bankruptcy of believers under the kingdom program. Uh, believe you me. When it comes to the fact that you've got to, in the tribulation period, one of the things you have to do as part of your package faith deal is sell all you have. Uh, I guarantee you that's going to be tough. It's going to be tough, would be tough for all of us here. That's why we always praise the Lord just a little extra special when we study in this manner to say, aren't you glad you're saved by grace in this dispensation? If you don't appreciate that, I guarantee you, I do. I wouldn't have to pray I want to pray every day for my uh, daily bread. Okay, I just want to go to wherever and buy it. Where am I? I don't know. Uh, all right, verse number 
at 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. The gate, of course, is the gate to the kingdom, the door of the kingdom. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door, you begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Now, we're, we're going to go from here in just a moment, and we're going to go straight to Noah because there is a, there's an illustration here. What do you suppose happened? No, well, <laughs> what do you suppose happened when uh, the first thunder clapped and uh, in the time of the gathering storm clouds at Noah? What do you suppose happened to that ark? I, here's what I believe happened. People began to knock at the door. We'll see that as, a, as an illustration of the kingdom here in a minute. I know you not, verse 25. Then shall ye begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in your presence, and you have taught in our streets. I tell you, I know you not. When she are, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. In other words, they were just like the Pharisee. They honored God with their lips and not with their heart. They didn't do what was actually required of them to do. They made a pretense of, of believing. It was a feigned faith. So everybody would, would say, oh, yeah, you're just so religious. You, you. But in actuality, they had no heart reality. And, uh, and so I never knew you. You're a worker of iniquity. Can you imagine that? Here we're talking about, and this is why I always say, I don't care what, what the church, or how big the church is, how nice the church is. If they don't preach the truth, they're workers of iniquity. They're false apostles teaching false doctrine. They're false prophets leading people astray. Big church, rich church, numerical growth doesn't make, mean a thing. What matters is, does the preacher preach the truth? And does the congregation support him in the truth? Other than that, it's just another self-righteous, uppity church that is meaningless to God. They're workers of iniquity. Okay, I'm back off my ivory soapbox now and back to verse 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Here's a Jew who had the covenants given to them. But remember, Daniel says that they hate the holy covenant. They don't care about it, but they make a pretense of going through Israel's vain religious system. You're going to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourself thrust out. Now, that's what the keys of the kingdom were the ability to let people in, the ability to keep people out, the ability to hold fast their sin. You have not truly repented and believed. Therefore, I bind your sin on you. You can't enter in until you repent. Oh, I see that you have humbled yourself before God. You are worthy and qualified. You believed what was required. Come on into the kingdom. Now, just well, let's, let's go to Revelation again while we're doing this. Chapter 3. I think we'll, uh, we'll do this, and while we're on the subject, we'll go into Israel's uh, mandated bankruptcy things. Now, the reason that I'm uh, here then in Revelation is that he speaks, verse number 14, to the church of the Laodiceans. Verse number 15, I know your works, neither cold nor hot, I wish or I would that you were either cold or, or hot. Because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now here's a group of people that will live in Asia Minor, or modern day Turkey. They will be living there and during the tribulation period, there are going to be Jews that will flee up there. And they are going to be totally indifferent to their plight, some of them. They are what's called lukewarm. They're not going to take a stand one way or the other. No, they don't want, they want to go to the, uh, into the kingdom, but they don't want to give up their possessions, you see. And that's why he goes on to say, because you say, I am rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing. Don't you know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Now, I, 
I liked to, when they took us on site here at Laodicea because you could uh, look off uh, uh, to the one side and you could see the hot springs. And they had aqueducts that would bring this water down there and they would use it for uh, bathing and, and medicinal purposes and so forth. But it was pretty hot as it came up from the ground uh, several miles away. But guess what it was by the time that it was uh, piped there to um, Laodicea? Lukewarm. Then off to the, uh, the other side, you could see mountains there that were snow-capped. And they would draw that water down because it would melt and there would be some, some nice springs. But again, it would come cold. But by the time it got there uh, through the aqueduct that was heated with the sun, in uh, those, uh, uh, that climate and conditions, guess how it would arrive? Lukewarm. Uh, I guess they, they couldn't win either way. <laughs> but the Lord used that, therefore, to say, hey, do you like drinking lukewarm water? No. Uh, and actually, uh, the water from the sulfur springs didn't uh, smell very good, uh, didn't taste all that good, and it would make one uh, sick. They needed to uh, do things to it to, to purify it and so forth. Anyway... Uh, that's what he says. Because you're neither one way or the other, you make me sick. Now, at the end of the tribulation period, or through the tribulation period, what are people going to have to do? They're going to have to, as they say, declare themselves. Whose side are you on? These people didn't want to declare. They, did, they still wanted the blessings of God, but they did not want to give up their worldly possessions in order to be part of that kingdom program that saw people safely through to the end. Now, how do we know that? Look at verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. Oh yeah, Pastor, this verse uh, applies to the dispensation of grace. Jesus Christ coming into our hearts, we have fellowship with him. It does not, has nothing whatsoever to do with it. It is kingdom ground, kingdom program. Now let me show you who uh, it is. Come to Matthew 25 once again. Matthew chapter 25. And verse number 30 says, Cast ye the unprofitable servant. It is a Jew who would not utilize, we, we're not going to read from verse 14 on down to this point, it, it talks about the talents that people that were given of God that, that were developed and used for the furtherance. That's, that's the symbolism of the kingdom. But because the one servant retained it, he wouldn't use it for Christ. He held on to it. He begrudged the use of it by, by the Lord. Uh, he refused to sacrifice it. Cast ye the unprofitable servant. Into outer darkness, there'll be weeping and gnashing of, of teeth. Now, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he's going to sit upon the throne of his glory. Context, end of the tribulation, and um, the battle of Armageddon is done. The people that al are alive and remain are gathered to Jerusalem, central point. They're gathered by the angels. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he's going to separate them as a shepherd does, dividing sheep from goats. The goats are those people at the end of the tribulation period that have either taken the mark of the beast and bought into the world system, or uh, they have refused to believe and help the Jews. Stay with me because the, you'll get some enlightenment as to that verse of Scripture. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Who really is knocking? Well, it's not Jesus Christ, but in essence, it is him. It is one of the standards by which Christ is going to judge the sheep 
and the goats at that time. He'll set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left. Then the king shall say to them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I, now wait a second, Jesus Christ is sitting up in, in heaven. And now he's saying, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me, sick, you visited me in prison, and you came to me. Behold, Jesus is saying, I stand at the door and knock. But he's, he's, uh, it really doesn't mean him uh, personally. It's him in the person of the faithful remnant that sold all their possessions. They don't have anything other than if they took the mark of the beast, then they uh, wouldn't have salvation. Then shall the righteous say to him, Lord, when saw we thee hungered and fed, thirsty and gave thee drink, a stranger took thee in and so forth, in prison and visited thee. Then the king said unto them, Verily I say, insomuch as ye have done it unto one of these, the least of my brethren, ye have done it to me. So when Jesus speaks to that yet future group in Laodicea, you're neither hot nor cold, you're rich, but I'm telling you, you're poor. You, you say you've got everything, but you are wretched and you just don't understand it. Yes, you, you are uh, following the world's pattern of retaining the possessions and not giving them to people knocking at the door. But behold, it's as though I were knocking at the door. And when you let that person in, you're letting me in to sup with you, to, to be taken care of and um, vice versa. All right, let's move on. But he's going to say, verse 41, to those on his left hand, depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And note the same standards. I was hungry. You gave me no meat. I was thirsty. You gave me no drink. Here were the Laodiceans. They were rich, but they were indifferent to the plight of those who bought into the kingdom program and sold all they had. And so when they were fleeing from Antichrist, fleeing the world system, these people had the means to, to provide food for these folks, and they were indifferent to them. That's why Jesus said, hey, when they're knocking at the door, it's the same as I'm knocking at the door. And the thing is, here's the standard. You don't let them in. You don't let me in. And I'm not going to let you in where? The kingdom. Okay. I was a stranger. You took me not in. Sick. Uh, you didn't. Um, uh, and in prison, you didn't visit me. Then shall they say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, a thirst, a stranger, naked, sick, and so forth, and did not minister to you? Inasmuch, says verse 45, as ye did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. Now, if that doesn't give you fantastic illumination as to a verse of Scripture in the book of Revelation, that verse is all about Jews who are faithful to Christ, who have nothing because they sold all. So they would not have to buy into the system and fled. But when they came upon people in other nations of the world into which they flee, and they're dispersed, uh, that could provide them means... Some are going to do it. Those are the sheep nations because they're going to believe what they say and they're going to believe in Christ and they're going to help these remnant believers. The others are not, just like many of the Laodiceans. They're going to uh, hold on to or retain their possessions. Okay, let's, let's go back here. We've just got um, a few minutes. Chapter 4 of Matthew. Then we'll go to chapter 5 and we'll... Start here next time in Israel's bankruptcy. Verse 17. Let me give you a, another uh, light bulb, as it were. From that time, Jesus is beginning his, uh, his public ministry here. Verse 17, Matthew 4. He began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember, they just had a few years to, from where he was speaking, three years to the end of the 69-week prediction, or 483 years, and then the end of the seven-year uh, prediction, or the one week, which is seven years, the tribulation period. 
So when he said this, there were just 10 years left, basically, uh, per se speaking, repent for the kingdoms of hand. It's right down the road, just a short time. Do you know that it is the, this, the month of March for 1990? You talk about time going fast. The month of March is almost gone. That there are only 290 shopping days till Christmas left. Unbelievable. Okay. Chapter 5, verse number 1. Um, I think we've got enough time here. Seeing the multitudes, he went to the mountain. Uh, the mountain, of course, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in that day, and all the kingdoms of the world shall flow into it. He's sitting on a mountain, symbolic of the fact that there's coming a time when the king is going to sit upon the holy mountain of Zion and, and rule Israel. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, What is the first thing out of his mouth in it, after he said, Repent, for the kingdom is at hand? Now, we're building to a point here of Israel's mandated bankruptcy for the kingdom. What are they saying? Verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, blessed, he doesn't say blessed are the poor. The apostle Paul says that if a man um, can work and, and, and doesn't and just relies on the dole, I mean, that's what he's all about, he should need. That's part of the grace program. Why? Because if a man trusts Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is going to provide his needs under the kingdom program. Blessed are the poor. Why? Because the poor will know, and we'll see it from the book of Daniel next hour, that they have to sell all they have if they're ever going to make it through the tribulation period. Their snare is worldly possessions. So Jesus, the first thing out of his mouth says, not just the poor, they are the poor in spirit. These are the wise who understand that worldly possessions provide the snare in the, in the tribulation period that will not get them into the kingdom. Now, again, we just looked at Laodicea. You're rich, but actually you're poor. Uh, you're rich and you could develop these riches to help the, the rest of the remnant, but you don't do it. So you're poor because you're not going to get in the kingdom. And true riches are found in the kingdom. Where your heart is, the kingdom, there will your treasure be also.